and welcome to Palace Confidential. It's your weekly look at the latest royal news. Of course, I'm Joe Elvin, and back with me today are the Daily Mail's royal editor, Rebecca English, and the Mail on Sunday's editor at large, Charlotte Griffiths. Welcome both. Now, I must say for the Edenites, Richard is very poorly today. Um, you're just going to have to stay strong. We're a able panel. We'll get the through sisterhood. This we will get through <laughs> the it. The sisterhood, yeah. Because there is so much to discuss from another row over the coronation to the Sussexes, the Waleses and the Duke of York. They do keep us busy. And we'll have some of your comments in a few minutes. But first, plans for King Charles's coronation were back in the news this week, and in particular, what role his son, Prince Harry, might play in them, if he comes, that is. Charlotte, in your paper on Sunday, you had reports that the King had been asking for help to clear the air so that Harry can join the coronation, even suggestions of deals over titles and prominent seats. Tell us everything. Um, so, yeah, so he's asked uh, Justin Welby to intervene and persuade Harry and Meghan to come or negotiate the terms in which they're, they're going to come. And I think it's a really good idea because Justin Welby is quite f fond of Meghan and Harry. Is he? Um, Even after the whole apparently we so. got married in secret in yeah. the garden, actually that wasn't true. Well, he sort of corrected that, but he gave them a little bit of wiggle room. He said there were multiple meetings after, um, after I first met them and maybe in one of them we did something. You know, he sort of fudged it for them. He didn't just drop them in it. <laughs> um, but I think, you know, I think it takes the patience of a saint probably to negotiate with those two and mm. in lieu of a saint maybe he's the next best thing and um, I think probably Prince Charles is actually the least qualified person to do this at this point because he just doesn't seem to be able to bang his son's heads together in a way that perhaps the Queen could have done if she was still alive and in fact in spare Harry alludes to the fact that the Queen once did sort of play that kind of role between them. Um, but yeah, so 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 it's fallen to Justin Welby to do it this time, by the sounds of things. Do you think it's going to work, Rebecca? Is there really a referee on earth who can sort this out? I think it's going to take more than a man of God. I have to say, <laughs> <laughs> I really God do. Himself. Even as one as highly yeah. anointed as he is, um, and I also think it's it's a family matter because at the end of the day, Harry's going to have no official role, as we understand in the coronation, so he's going to be there actually as a guest of his father. Um, so I kind of feel it's, it's a family matter for them to sort out. I mean, I, I have to say, I flip-flop how I feel personally about this from week to week. Some weeks I think, look, you know, they actually were OK when they came over for the Queen's Platinum Jubilee. Uh, Richard pointed that out, I think, very astutely the other week. So why not just all be there, even if there is ructions behind the scenes, you know, put on a show for the day. And then other weeks, I think, look, you know, Harry says he's a huge supporter of the monarchy and he believes in it. And yet in his kind of words and deeds in the last few months, he seems to be doing everything he can to undermine it. So why, why could he not actually excuse himself from it and just say, look, thank you, be very gracious about it, but I'm, but I'm not going to come. I, I can't quite make my it, mind up. I, I it's, think it's they're another... that him not being there will distract from the occasion mm. as well. So I think also they're actually him being there. there might distract from the occasion as well. Yeah, so. I mean, it is an impossible situation. Yeah. You can see why they do want a third party. It is a Hobson's choice. And, and, and yeah. it's another one of these things, isn't it, where it isn't just a family matter. It's... It's the royal family, it's a matter of constitution, a matter of tradition, it's a matter of the firm. So but I suppose what is the right making, solution? They're making a point of saying we are changing some of the traditions in this, so why wouldn't the guest list change as well? I yeah. don't know. It's, it's a tricky yeah, one. It's, and what, what do you think, thing. you alluded to it earlier, you know, it doesn't really do the king any favours that, he, he, as you say, everybody seems pretty much in agreement that he can't sort this out. Yeah, I mean, you get the impression he's probably tried for several years to, to sort this out, but he's sort of had to throw up his hands and say, I think he's probably had the good grace, actually, to say, look, I obviously can't do this, so I'm going to have to get somebody else to help. I mean, these are two brothers that the issue is so complicated. I mean, God knows we've been documenting it, you know, week after week. It's so unbelievably complicated. Um, and there's also the added complication of Charles worrying about William, because it sounds like um, William doesn't particularly want Harry there. So he's got to, he's got to keep both sons happy. It's just an know, impossible thing to do. What's so interesting is for the longest time, even working at the Mail on Sunday and you'd hear all the rumours about the brothers not getting on. And I used to think that that was a bit sort of like possibly overblown press speculation and actually when you read Harry's book it's even worse yeah, and so even truer worse. than I ever imagined. Which yeah. is what we said that actually yeah. after yeah. you know spending so much time denigrating the media his book mm. actually proved what we all were saying was true. Yeah.
Yeah, so there is this lack of trust between William and Harry, and William, as the Mail on Sunday reported on the weekend, uh, fears that Harry might pull some kind of stunt while he's over. So that's one of his big fears. And there and was... What, what kind of a stunt? Well, like a walkabout in, in a borough of London, like a sort of, you know, impoverished borough. Um, something unscripted, basically, not part of the programme. And there was a little bit of a sense of that after the Queen died, um, wasn't there, when there was that huge kerfuffle and they did a walkabout together and there were a few there's a bit of speculation at the time that Harry was about to pull some sort of unscripted walkabout and so William intervened and in the end they had that really awkward walkabout the four of them after the Queen died so I wonder whether there's another fear that something like that might happen again and I think there's always the fear now isn't there that anything that's said in private will end up in a book yeah, I mean, of course, you yeah. can't, can't trust him at all. Absolutely. I mean, that is the whole thing about Spare, is that he has gone into, you know, the most intimate family conversations and, you know, interactions in, su in such... Interactions, <laughs> yes. That's <laughs> in, a polite way to yeah, put it. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, in such a detailed way that, you know, how can you... How can the trust ever be regained. It'll be, so awkward. It It'll be so awkward behind the scenes, yeah. they'll have to just not talk to him. They go, they will, they'll just have to say good morning and that's it. Oh, I hope they come. <laughs> so, I really do. But let, let's move on. I want to turn to a story, Rebecca, that you covered this week, the Prince and Princess of Wales at a food bank. And I think it's fair to say that on social media, at least, they came in for some criticism for that. Yeah, I thought this was quite an interesting subject to discuss because it does go down to the really the nub of, of what the royals do and, and what their role is. So, um, and I should say, uh, I was there on the visit with them and I just noticed on my timeline for days afterwards, there was a lot, a lot of criticism of them going to a food bank, it, given the fact that they are members of the royal family and live in palaces and have unlimited funds. Now, I think it's really important to point out that those people, as far as I could see, were real anti-monarchists anyway. So I think there's, there's nothing the royal family that could do that would please them. But I do think it raises kind of interesting debate about, you know, the legitimising of food banks in the country in this day and age. Are they right to go and visit them? Should they ignore that they're there? What do they do? And I, I, the one thing I have to say from being there with them is that the volunteers, there were 48 volunteers that run this food bank, and they were actually very grateful they'd gone, very grateful that they'd taken the time to learn about what they were doing, to sit down, to talk to them, to say thank you for everything you're doing. Yes, they didn't meet any clients, but that was because the charity were very keen to protect their privacy. So I think they did try to conduct the visit in the sensitive way as possible and uh, certainly the charity itself was was very keen for them to be there but of course I do think it raises you know big points of debate. It is hard isn't it Charlotte to be royal and relatable? I suppose so but I think these anti-monarchists kind of miss the entire point of the monarchy if they're not there to do nice things for people less fortunate than themselves I mean they can't they can't talk about politics so what can they do if they can't cut rid ribbons and go to food well, banks I suppose anti-monarchists I mean, think that we should be using that money to help those starving yeah. people instead of paying for the palaces yeah well and the other well the other thing about that visit is that it wasn't just about people said it was a sort of poverty safari and it was a PR stunt but it was also about those 48 workers mm. and then feeling god like we're being recognized for this look Prince William Williams come and said you're doing a good job so it's about them as well it wasn't just about you know the publicity I don't think and, and they did scale. make a point of not coming there saying we think you should be doing this that mm. and the other they actually just sat there and listened mm. which I think is quite important but did we want them to come out of the car with Tesco's bags of baked beans because that's a bit of the criticism well, was like why do they turn off empty handed what, what do you think they could or should have done differently yeah and there was as Charlotte said there was a lot of commentary people saying why did they turn up empty handed and I have to say that is something that occurred to me when I saw them get out the car but then I think well, you know, if you turned up with, with bags of shopping, would you be look, looked at and criticised for being patronised? Yeah, I think it would have been. Um, you know, is, would people say, well, that's just a, a drop in the ocean of, mm. of what this country needs and the help that these people need to get? Maybe they could have turned up with maybe some trays of kind of home-baked kind of cookies and, you know, cakes for the, for the staff. Or Dutch Originals. Yep, Dutch Originals. Actually, I they love gave the Dutchy away. lemon milk. But and we it, would have killed them for that because we would have said, those are 4 99 a packet. Yeah. We can't all eat shortbread, blah. 
blah, blah, blah. Which I think goes back to this. <laughs> actually, they, they can't win on some things, can they? Mm. And I like think, on the whole, given the reaction of the people there, it was better that they came and mm. thanked them for what they were doing than ignore the fact that this is going on in, in their backyard, mm. basically, at mm. Windsor. Mm. Well, let's move on. Well, now, you like hearing what our panel have to say, and we love hearing your thoughts. So let's go to a couple of them now. On the subject of the coronation and whether the wider family should be allowed on that royal balcony, Linda Fielding wants a big old show at Buckingham Palace. She says, yes, I think all of the family and their children should be on the balcony, even Camilla's children. It's a big balcony. Good point, well made. Well, Eva Andrews, however, disagrees. No, they should not be on the balcony and neither should Andrew. Can you imagine those two near the decent, hardworking royals? Well, Eva, stick with us. We'll have more Andrew news in a minute. And finally, a comment and a question from Dorothy Segovia. Great episode. Love Joe's snappy comments and sparkly look. Thank you. That isn't my mum, Dorothy, but that's very kind. Thank you. We're looking forward to the coronation celebration, she says. And by the way, what did Robert Hardman mean by knees up? Rebecca, can you translate that idiom for some of our foreign viewers? I have to say, by the way, I think if Dorothy liked your sparkly trousers the other week, she's going <laughs> to love your shoes <laughs> she today. She can see them. Yeah. <laughs> um, it means a, it's a, a good old-fashioned jolly. You know, yeah. it's, a, it's a party, basically. Knees up. I suppose it's about the dancing, isn't it? Yeah. You dance with your knees up. It's kind oh, of okay. an East End kind of phrase. So yeah. nothing yeah. like Mother Brown, yeah. Not sexual no. in this occasion. No, OK, thank you very much for clearing <laughs> that up. Well, as always, please keep those comments coming in and questions, if you have any, you can leave them below. Email us at palace at mailplus.co.uk or find us on social media where we are at mailplus. Now, we also had quite a few comments about how you can get our Richard Eden's weekly newsletter. I'll give you two ways. You can click the link in the description below or click on screen here now. And we really hope Richard gets well soon because we need him to write that newsletter. No sympathy here. Crack on with it, mate. Now, back to my panel. And in recent shows, we've discussed the Duke of York's PR campaign to rehabilitate his image. Now, Charlotte, at the weekend, we had not one, but two quite extraordinary stories relating yeah. to our dear Prince Andrew. Well, yeah, the first one was <clears throat> this photo, this famous photo that he's alluded to being a fake and Ghislaine Maxwell has said is a fake of him with his arms around Virginia. Um, it seems now that there's, there's no doubt about it. It is a real photo because the Mail on Sunday uncovered the back of the photo and it showed that it had been printed in Walgreens in Florida. The dates matched up. It was in a one hour fo photo development um, place and uh, yeah it just seems like the photo is real and that's the end of his little you know allude you know his, his, his tendency to allude to the fact that it's a fake that's some detective work yeah that's well, some serious detective work and well done the photographer who took three frames of the back of the photo as well as the original photo when he first took a picture of the picture 10 years or so ago so why do we think Ghislaine is uh, claiming that it's a fake how can she I don't know. I suppose she's just sort of clutching at straws. Maybe yeah. she didn't think that the Mail on Sunday had done a thorough job back then, wow. 10 years ago. Maybe she was just hoping for the best, hoping she could mm. make that claim. And I think, as we've said on previous shows, you know, this photograph is at the heart of all of this because yes. it is, you know, it is the tangible proof that Andrew did meet Virginia mm. Joffrey yeah. those years ago. It, I mean, we still don't know, as I always say, no one knows the truth of any of this apart mm. from two people, and they have very different mm. accounts of what may or may not have happened. Yes. That photograph, you know, so if, they, if, if Andrew's supporters can cast any sort of negativity around that or doubt around that photograph, then they can start to cast negativity and doubt on everything mm. else she says. Well, there was another unique tactic thrown into the whole fray this week, wasn't there, with that extraordinary picture on the front of the Telegraph newspaper of the bath scenario where the Maxwell family are sort of like enacting it to say that two people couldn't have done what Virginia is saying was being done in that bath. I've never seen anything quite like it. What, what do we make goes, of it? definitely <laughs> goes under your list of things that once seen can yeah. never be unseen. How can I unsee this, please? Well, what, what it proves is that two people can fit very happily in a bath. In um, that, in, and in that bath. <laughs> and in yeah. that particular bath. Yeah. And um, Andrew's trying to say there wasn't enough room for toe sucking. Oh, I can't believe we're even I just can't bear this. it. I can't bear it. And there was plenty of room for toe sucking, but, you know, I just it's the level of delusion that he he thought that that would the photographs him. on their faces as well i mean i just oh, it was, yeah yeah taste was lacking um, <laughs> but i but i my question is because i think we've alluded to and we've discussed before on this program that 
you know, reportedly Andrew's been saying something's going to come out that's going to really throw this case into a new light. Is this is this what he was referring to? Do we think? I honestly don't know, but if it, if he was pinning his hopes on this, I think he's probably bat the wrong horse. We need, we, need, we need Richard Eden here because it was Richard Eden that broke mm. this scoop a couple of weeks ago that Andrew had been telling people on a shoot, something's going to come out and it's going to exonerate me. And it seems to, all signs seem to indicate that this is what, this is what he thought would exonerate him. I mean, it's just embarrassing. I just, I'm, I've been speechless for days over the whole thing, but we've been discussing it for a while, obviously, and it seems that he's unlikely to go away, or as a, the Queen reportedly suggested, he go and do some quiet charity work. What, what, what next? I've said this before, and I've been incorrect before, but you'd think this time he's, he's going to realise, <laughs> you know what, I, I don't think I can come back into public life. It's just every time he attempts, it gets more and more embarrassing. I think you'll know better than I, but he's got a big interview lined up as well, um, I'm hearing. Oh, really? Not another I mean, one. how has he not learnt from Emily Maitlis? Uh, you know, in the photograph. I, I think he does, he really needs to just slip away. Another interview. I mean, I think they're probably considering a lot of options, mm. but I, you know, I, I, I know people who were involved in that Maitlis interview years ago, and they genuinely thought if he went there as, a, as an open and honest man, an open book and told people, you know, they, they genuinely thought people would believe him. Yeah. Um, they, and they, even as those initial trailers were going on, they were going, well, this is great, isn't it? It was like, can you not see the car crash that is unfolding yeah. here? And they, they genuinely couldn't see it. So unless he's got dramatically different people around him advising him, I'm... Not yeah. that much hope well, it's that. interesting you called it a publicity campaign. I just it doesn't feel like a publicity campaign at all. It feels like stumbling through life, making these terrible mistakes and getting very confused about what's real and what isn't real. It doesn't feel like a campaign. He should, have, if anything, be coordinating a little bit better. On the plus side, he keeps us busy here at Palace Confidential. <laughs> but Rebecca, back for a moment on the Princess of Wales, and she was talking about her early years program at the end of last week and. To the outsider, it might look like a bit of a relaunch. Does that sound fair? Yeah, so probably just to kind of, I suppose, encapsulate what's happened over the last few days is that she has launched the next phase of her big early years project, which is about raising awareness of the importance of what happens to us as children between birth to five in terms of defining the rest of our lives. And um, this campaign is called Shaping Up, and at the heart of it is, sorry, not Shaping Up, Shaping Us. Um, and at the heart of it is a, a 90 second animation of a little girl and all the people she has interactions with in her life. And she did engagements in Leeds on uh, Tuesday, which I was with her at. And uh, there's a few really good things to come at you over the next couple of days. Saturday's a good day to look out for. I can't say any oh, more than that. Such a tease, I Rebecca English. Um, so it is. So it, you know, it's 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 a huge project for her. Um, Obviously, some people have, have said, you know, where does this take us, though? You know, isn't this what you've been doing over the last couple of years? And um, what they're making clear is that, you know, she's not trying to kind of facilitate immediate change. What she sees is this is a much more long term project, a bit like the Heads Up mental health campaign that she, William and Harry did so successfully, you know, eight, ten years ago. Um, and then she wants to kind of bring that same energy to this. Yeah, I suppose Charlotte, uh, her father-in-law, Charles, uh, he's taken decades for some of his messages to be heeded and yeah. taken seriously. Is it, it, should Kate be prepared to play the long game here? Yeah, she probably is. She's an expert at playing the long game. She always has been. <laughs> um, yeah. You know, I think, I, I mean, she's get, getting a bit of flack, isn't she? Because it's sort of raising awareness is kind of pithy and a bit vague. But um, I think give her some time. And I think it's quite an authentic thing for her because she clearly does care about children in their early life. It's an actual genuine thing that she's mm. interested in. So just give it some time. Who knows what might happen on Saturday? I think, I think there's a, I think authenticity actually is a really good word to use because that is a thing. She's never wanted to go in there, you know, at breakneck speed and start telling people what they should do. But unlike other people we yeah, could mention, yeah. but do you think <laughs> there's more listening and learning? There is potentially um, a political element here, isn't there? Mm. Because obviously, a huge struggle for parents in this country is childcare mm. in those early years. Do you think she would ever sort of like wade into that 
area of the whole and In fact, argument. I think they're trying to do the very opposite of that. Yeah. I mean, it's difficult because there's this whole issue in the UK of sure start centres, which were set up by previous government and have been uh, basically cancelled by the, the current government. And there's a lot of comments saying, look, it's all right raising awareness, but when we're seeing things that can actually practically help our children and have the best start of life, um, you know, what are you doing still talking about it? But, you know, I think we've got to think back to that. I thought that mental health comment that somebody made to me was really astute that actually you know, 10, 12 years ago, we weren't talking about mental health in the way that we are doing now. So, you know, let, let's not run before, you know, we can walk and let's make sure people are aware of this issue before we start, start trying to kind of facilitate lasting change. And of course, you're right, she can't get political. She can't start saying, I want the government to change policy. But what they did with mental health was create such a buzz around it and such a talk that that kind of thing evolved organically mm. and that it was other people calling for better mental health provision rather than the royals themselves. And I suspect that's what they're trying to achieve here. That's really interesting. Well, I'm afraid that's all we have time for today. There is just time to say thank you to Rebecca and Charlotte. And of course, to you as ever for watching. And we will see you next week on Palace Confidential. Bye bye.